Um, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us um, uh, for our first webinar of the year. I am super excited to kind of get back at it. Um, had a little bit of a few weeks to settle into the new year. Um, we are chatting today with um, David Chen about ethics and corporate compliance. Uh, my name is Kelly Rodriguez Curry. I am the director of our Master of Legal Studies program and our new sports law program. Uh, I'm excited to tell you about that in April for our April webinar um, at Seattle University School of Law. I am an alum here and I graduated in 2014, which I just realized is almost 10 years ago. Um, Man, that goes by fast. Uh, I earned my uh, law degree and my Master of Sports Administration and Leadership here. Um, and I've got my contact information below, but I've got that uh, listed on the last slide too. So no need to scribble that down too quickly. Um, and David, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what you do. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. It's wonderful to have folks on the call and joining us. I too am an alum of Seattle University School of Law. I graduated in 2010. Um, and so, yeah, just got my feet underneath me uh, in the middle of the recession, as many people know and love. And I think that's really important just to point out uh, because, you know, the legal practice and I think the risk and compliance practice that we talked about is really shaped by the things that are going on in our society. So, you know, I've been uh, really privileged to go from that uh, law school into litigation practice. So I practice in civil litigation, which is typically um, bringing the types of lawsuits that you would hear about that aren't in the criminal justice system. So the types of claims where, you know, one party or one organization or individual feels that they need to bring a claim against another. So did that for a while, typically related to what would be known colloquially as police misconduct, which is an interesting topic here, as well as employment discrimination. Um, moved in-house, and what that means is, you know, moved from a private sector law firm representing individuals into a place where I was serving as a one client staff attorney, also known as a general counsel or an in-house counsel, and did that in a nonprofit organization for about six or seven years and got the chance to build a corporate ethics and compliance program. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then from there, really um, felt my mission and calling and, and, you know, SU talks a lot about social conscious calling and a lot about social justice and built really on that foundation at SU uh, to want to get into healthcare and predominantly healthcare relating to folks that are experiencing houselessness uh, or um, are chronically unsheltered. So just started that role, I guess just started as a term almost two years now in Portland, Oregon to serve as a general counsel for Central City Concern, which provides homeless health care as well as transitional housing for about 4,000 folks here in the Portland metro area. That's amazing. I am um, super intrigued by your, your path um, to compliance and especially nonprofit compliance. I don't think that we think about nonprofit compliance um, specifically very often, so I'm excited to have you here um, and really appreciate your time. Thank you. See. So could you tell us, I'm trying to get my slide to advance here and it does not want to. Um, let's see. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what your organization does and kind of specifically in both the healthcare field, but then also more broadly in nonprofit? Yeah, and it's always funny because I think all of us would reflect on, you know, folks on this call and others, maybe second career or maybe looking at really evaluating for themselves what they want to do. Um, when we look back at our own path and our own leadership journey, it's oftentimes the things that you least expect that would bring us to where we are, and, and very much so in my travel and path to Central City Concern. And the reason that I am really interested in Central City Concern, and, and this was sort of, um, I would say, sort of the, the direction I wanted to go long term, was really because when we're looking at shaping policy, and we're looking at shaping systems, and we're looking at moving a mission forward, um, an organization oftentimes sees itself as either a direct deliverer of those services or a change agent. Um, Central City is really looking at both, uh, which has been fantastic because when you look at the issues surrounding um, folks that are facing homelessness or um, the type of uh, you know, challenging medical fragility that addiction brings or a dual diagnosis of a severe mental illness, you're looking not only at providing that care, which we do, you know, 
we've run about 12 what are called federally qualified health clinics. So those are everything from primary care to what's called substance use disorder clinics, so helping people with their addiction challenges, mental health challenges, all the way to like working on systems advocacy. So the way that our insurance payers, so you know, all of us or some of us may have access to private insurance or public insurance through Medicaid or Medicare. And how does that work itself, especially for those folks that are suffering serious mental health or addiction challenges and accessing the type of care they need? And then ultimately the social determinants of health, which are things like housing, employment, stability around education, um, and even barriers to legal issues, right? So one of the great joys is looking at all that complexity at the same time but then also thinking about ways that an organization can impact that one, one day at a time. So Central City is really in that space. It's unreal to think about all of these systems, right? The, the housing, the health, the recovery, and the education, and how they all kind of come together and intersect in this space. Um, and how does the nonprofit like layer over that for you all? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's fun because, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about the intersectionality of, an, of a program like that, what the master's program at Seattle University offers and what's really needed in our community. And that intersectionality is so true in the nonprofit world, right? Because you're looking at complex systems and you're looking at public and private partnerships. A lot of our partners are nonprofit partners, you know, things like um, Kaiser Permanente or Providence Health Systems, absolutely. But there's also a business focus for sustainability purposes that connect to that. And really when you look at a program like uh, the risk management or the master's in legal studies program at SU, you're looking at very much the same things, which are what are the goals of an organization as they rely on being sustainable, being scalable, improving that, but then what's the layer of the mission driver, right? What are the goals and outcomes? Um, oftentimes, you know, having the opportunities to be very briefly in the private sector, you know, it's always really about maximizing shareholder value, right? That's, that's it, maximizing profits, maximizing return. And that's in some ways true for the nonprofit sector, but those owners are the community. So the owners of the community are asking, well, then how are you measuring a return to see folks exit homelessness into permanent housing or to see them um, get into long-term recovery? Um, you know, and, and I think anyone that's worked in this community knows that it's a recovery journey. It's never a recovery destination. And so that's really valuable and important when you look at the types of things that you set for yourself uh, and thinking about what is risk and what does compliance mean in this environment, right? It's very different. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things we talk a lot about in the program is um, in, our, in our master's program is really kind of the intersection of um, business and, and law. And it's one of the things I love about the program is this intersection. And it's very much an operational intersection where we take um, and and you and I both having um, graduated from a JD program, there are things that our students do in the master's program that a JD student does not, cannot do upon graduation, right? Um, and in evaluating statutes and really pulling apart things that we do with our students in the master's program that you don't do as a JD student. And that operational intersection um, where rubber meets the road and when we talk about operationalizing things in business, you're really trying to serve the stakeholders, whether that's in a for-profit organization where your stakeholders are shareholders, or where it's in a not-for-profit organization where your stakeholders are the community or the constituent groups, right? Um, it's it's just kind of, you know, who are you serving, right? Clients, shareholders, um, community members, uh, customers, yeah. Uh, it's fascinating the work that you do. Um, let's see, so could we'll you tell us a little bit about you come down to Portland to visit Kelly? <laughs> I'm excited. Well, the next time when Timbers, when the Timbers play, right? <laughs> well, yeah. as you know, I'm a Seattle native, so you and I might need to hide in the upper corner and not be in the Timbers uh, location. Know, yeah, maybe, so, maybe. Yeah, well, we've um, led so... into our sports law dial. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I know. We're gonna have some uh, some rivalry happening here soon. <laughs> <laughs> so what does a day look like in compliance for you? Yeah, it's such a really fascinating question. And, you know, I think underlying that when you think about 
um, you know, what you do on the day to day, especially as a general counsel in one vein, but more importantly, in a nonprofit environment, it's really important that you build up the types of analytical and deep thought skills that come from, you know, kind of graduate learning, but more importantly, the ability to know what you're about and then jive with your day to day. So my day could start anywhere from the more challenging parts of like, hey, we have litigation, which is, you know, we're notified of a lawsuit and we need to work with our internal folks as well as our external counsel that's re representing us. Everything to solving really tactical problems in the type of um, lens of risk and compliance. I'll give you a very tactical example of where even like the work that we do in our risk management program here at SU is really valuable, right? So for example, as a health center, we're subject to what's called HRSA, which is the agency that oversees what we do as a, a qualified health center. Um, one of those aspects is really around, obviously, the fact that we're dealing with addiction medicine and therefore controlled substances. So one of the things that we have is we have individuals that are using methadone um, for Medicaid-assisted treatment, but then also need to go externally to get that methadone and then potentially come back into our housing or our inpatient services. And sometimes there can be barriers on our regulatory side of the straight cut answer versus what we need to solve. So something I was just working on very tactically the other day was because of the long weekend, we had individuals that received only enough methadone to get them through the weekend. And these folks are very medically fragile. So it was a question of, can you put them back out into the system to actually go to what's called their opioid treatment provider, get another dose and come back. It's very dangerous for them. And it's really not the best clinical practice. So there's the easy bright line rule, but then there's how do you solve that within a risk analysis, which is you have medically fragile folks. We of course don't want to violate any of the rules and, and federal statutes. What are the solutions that we can come up with? So, you know, spending some time really looking at as you said, the statutory interpretation, talking to actual agency officers and building rapport and relationships and saying like, hey, this is a very unique situation and I know not contemplated. What are ways that we can do that? So working with sort of those agency representatives, the goal was how can my risk management staff and how can my compliance staff really find a solution of a both and or be really cut, clear cut on the limits of what we can do. And it's never perfect, but that type of deeper thinking, the ability for you know, a program like SU to come along and say, yes, surface level, it's very easy to say, here's the statute, this is what you can and can't do. But I'll be honest, as we all know, in the age of AI, that becomes almost uh, you know, a, a not a plus one. That's not a good enough ROI. So looking for leaders that have the value add of what, are, what does risk really mean and how do we find solutions um, around the fact that there are complicated issues that don't have a simple answer or simple solution. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of prospective students and even current students um, who are always grappling with the well, here is my background. How is this going to dovetail yeah. with a uh, master's of legal science or, you know, a, a law, a legal education? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, my background is in biological sciences, kinesiology, that sort of stuff. Um, and that's how I come at the sports angle. Um, but we have students who come in with social work backgrounds, right? And mm -hmm. I can see that being super applicable here. Um, nursing backgrounds or other healthcare backgrounds, pharmaceutical backgrounds, um, I can see, uh, you know, counseling backgrounds, right, and all of that kind of coming together to with a legal um, lens and a business lens, right, financial backgrounds um, to help craft a compliance approach that's going to try and fit all of these puzzle pieces together to meet the needs of your clientele. Hundred percent. Yeah, and there's a, there's this va va valuable pro con. I have the privilege of also teaching a couple of courses in risk management in this class, and I can't tell you how much joy, but also understandably uh, trepidation and excitement it brings when someone says, "Hey, I've taken this class, I've done this program, I'm really thinking about doing something different. I was an X, you know, and I wanted to move to Y. I mean, I had someone that worked at um, a really interesting kind of uh, electric uh, motorcycle startup. And it was all about, she called it homologation, which is sort of meeting the standards of a design of a vehicle for federal and state transportation requirements. And then she said, I really want to get into healthcare. <laughs> and she made the jump and she made the switch really by virtue of the fact that 
the methodologies of thinking and the methodologies of problem solving that we learn within a course uh, and within a longer program really do get us into the risk is risk wherever you go. Enforcement regulatory issues are regulatory issues wherever you go. The subject matter expertise really is just the substantive work, right? And so that just takes the time to ramp up and get substantively knowledgeable. The ability to think, the ability to solve those problems in a different way than your peers is what sets you apart. Right. I mean, it's funny. It's a. It's not a total like transition, but it is kind of right. One of the things that we do really well, and this is. I mean, I. I. I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like this will resonate. Right. We're both grads of Seattle University School of Law, and um, we have really awesome conversations in our classrooms, um, whether online or in our physical classrooms, and uh, they they're awesome in my view because we really tackle real world problems and we aren't afraid to um, hold two truths together even if they're contradictory Um, and that's where I think we kind of start to chip away at what is the ethical um, answer right I mean whenever I'm trying to solve a problem whether it's in a classroom or a hypothetical or a real world problem right I there's these like three prongs there's like the business solution there's the legal solution then there's the ethical solution and if I'm lucky two of the three might line up um very seldom do all of them line up and then you just kind of have to decide which approach you're going to take um and that's going to be different for all, all of us um and so I wonder kind of how do you in your amongst your team and your work, how do you reconcile some of those issues? Yeah, that is by far and away just a perfect segue because that's the hardest part by far. You know, it's oftentimes we learn the substantive capabilities, we learn the processes, the best practices and frameworks. And then the conversations always come back to relationships, culture building, value orientation. Um, You know, I love your slide because it always brings me back to at least my modus operandi, which is your values and your culture will drive your legal, your ethical, your risk profile and program. You know, it doesn't take much to look into the news and see some of the less than, you know, joyful (laughs) reporting and insider reporting and the spotlights that get shown on things that say really was never about the programs itself. It was really about the culture that was allowed and the values that were permissive or um, maybe even explicitly (laughs) exploited within Mm -hmm. those environments. Um, The thing about SU that has been a, a, a huge joy is that there was never a question and orientation around what really mattered to the school and what really mattered to us as as graduates and practitioners. Um, I think you, you know, not to be too uh, controversial, but you look no farther than the recent conversations around US news rankings and the departure thereof that we really, as um, institutions of higher education are realizing that if you're going to change cultures, you're going to have to really analyze that the danger of allowing for that lowest common denominator to be something as simple as scores or something as simple as employment after a certain period of time can be very detrimental, especially when you're realizing now that people are joining and leaving organizations based on values and based on actual you know, lack of a better term, put your walk the talk, right? And especially around DEI work and things like that, um, things become co-opted over time. And I think the real performance indicator of a culture and compliance program is yes, identifying some of those real control gaps and identifying some of those real process gaps, but then actually shifting culture, right? How are we measuring culture change and change management within an institution? And no matter how, you know, uh, how elevated, not not elevated, but really like how model your organization is, there's wonderful models of organizations, they still all benefit from a continued change management process and a continued accountability refinement process. Yeah, no, I think that you're right on. I mean, we, we have to be willing to walk the walk if that's the change that we want to see, right? And those decisions are hard. They're really, really challenging decisions, right? It's one thing to say it, um, but when it requires putting one foot in front of the other, 
um, it's challenging to make those decisions and receive the blowback and receive the the naysayers um, and and still continue to move forward. Um, and that's in compliance, you know, we joke sometimes, um, and we've heard it on other, you know, in other conversations that I've had with folks in our on our faculty. Um, you know, nobody likes the compliance people. Um, I think if you're doing it well, you know, compliance is just a part of your culture, and then that you're not like always the bad person. <laughs> um, so hopefully we get there. Um, I think one of the other things that I love about kind of our program uh, that differentiates us, I think, from others is um, we really do have this super uh, solid foundational core in our first year. And um, you teach a couple of those courses. I've taught a couple of them before. Um, and I, it, it's, they're challenging. They're really, really challenging. And I think that some folks are, um, you know, not, they're surprised a little bit, right? It is very much law school, right? It's okay. not a JD program, but it is law school hundred percent. And mm -hmm. um, but that's what provides that uh, framework for how do you really build a compliance program that's going to take you potentially across industries, right? That's going to allow you to move from automotive to healthcare. We've had mm -hmm. alum who's moved from pharmaceutical to data privacy to uh, another data privacy. I'm going to mess it up if I try to get too more specific, uh, much more specific, but mm -hmm. you've got this skill set where compliance and risk management is the skill set and you can pivot in so many different directions. Um, and it's built on these fundamental principles where the subject matter expertise is layered on top of that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's absolutely, um, it's remarkable how um, malleable that is. Yeah, absolutely, um, great. Yeah, I mean, I so this is our beautiful building and I get to stay in this like hang out in this building all the time um, and I love it. And David, you should come back up and visit. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we've kind of already like highlighted this uh, idea, our compliance with the conscience, right? So we've got this, um, we get to have really awesome hard conversations. So um, I don't know that we have to harp, harp on this too much more. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why my computer is beeping, so I apologize for all that. Um, <laughs> that can be a bit distracting. One thing I will say on the compliance of the conscience side, you know, I've appreciated um, for this program in particular is that we've had such bright um, individuals in the cohorts that have come through, and you see that that builds the quality of the program as a whole. I mean, I've had folks that you know, and wonderful thinkers that have years and years of fintech or financial regulatory support. And, you know, they're coming from Kenya or Tanzania. Um, and I think I had one from um, Bengali the other year and just, you know, brought their not only expertise and wisdom, but really a third way of thinking. I think we oftentimes need to recognize that compliance, especially within the construct of US organizations is invariably predicated on like that kind of Western definition. And it's so refreshing that SU works very hard to bring in a diverse cohort and a cohort that's going to say like, hey, there's this is a worldwide value system. And this is a really a capability set that translates not only across industry, but across culture and ideally across, you know, um, political borders or you know yeah, country sure. borders right uh, it's always been really fun I'm always shocked and I'm like oh my gosh you practiced in the UK and now you're here doing this program um, what does that mean to you how does that change the way you look at things and the way that you know you would approach racial justice or equity in a compliance model right because we're just codifying in compliance and and risk management we're codifying those value systems into real practical digestible behaviors and helping people walk the walk or talk the talk with that measuring stick, right? And to say, this is what we're about and how we want to run our organizations. I think it's, you're so right. I mean, when people ask me like, well, what does it mean to like have this degree in compliance and risk management, right? Um, like, to get a master's degree in that, like, what does that mean? And it's funny, like, I, I think back, you know, 20 years when I started my career, gosh, well, it's more than that now, if I'm being honest with myself. Um, but you know, back then it was, you know, we called them human resources people or director of operations, right? We didn't have this like compliance officer. It was just the folks, my 
title way back when was like a uh, director of like change process or process <laughs> change manager. I don't know what it was, but like, that's all it was, right? right? We just wrote out the policies and procedures and you looked at what does the code say? What are best practices? What is the, you know, what did we learn from the last event, right? And you, you tweak things, you change things, you ask good questions and you distill it down and it's a, this iterative process. And now we've got these, um, you know, we can apply legal writing to it. We can apply legal analysis to it and we've made it way better. Um, and you, we have way more, we have our own process around how to do this better. Um, but truly it's just, um, it, it's, it's all of the operationalization of these things that we've done for years in a much better format. Um, so I think that uh, on the one hand, it's all of the things we've done in operations for years, but with this legal lens, it makes it so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and just kind of like, it's funny that you mentioned like all this diversity um, around like the who we have in the classroom. <laughs> um, some highlights of the program. So we've got our focus areas. Um, it's worth noting that we don't restrict our students to um, taking things only in their focus area. You can take electives across all the focus areas. And we do that by design because we recognize that our students are coming from different areas and that healthcare intersects with finance um, and data and private security, privacy, uh, cybersecurity, pardon. Um, so our students take electives all um, across all the focus areas that they want to. Um, we're fully online, and that means that we've got students from all over the place, all over the country, um, and who have come in from other countries, like David was saying, um, and just highlighting some important dates um, coming up here, um, and then happy to open it up for questions. Is I'll leave these up, and then I'll put up my um, contact information too, but any other final thoughts, David, and then we'll take some questions if anybody has them. Yeah, no, no final thoughts other than, you know, so grateful for the time and investment folks that we've made to this point um, and looking and um, experimenting and and absolutely the deep dives are so important, right? Because the, the value of our time is really critical and picking the right spot and the right organization to partner with in my opinion, really does always come down to value orientation, right? Because that value orientation is going to always be deeper uh, than the anything else that we might factor into decision making. Um, because at the end of the day, those that's where the really challenging conversations happen. You know, I think we yeah. do so well at that at SU. Um, but to the extent that it also means that folks that go through this program oftentimes ask themselves the question, are they at the right place? Are they doing the right thing? Are they really finding deep and meaningful joy in the work that they uh, provide, not only to their community, but to themselves and caring for their families? So yeah, just deep appreciation. Yeah, I mean, to dovetail on that briefly, um, I want to thank you for your time. And I you teach um, pretty regularly for us, and I appreciate it so much. Um, it's worth noting that... Um, uh, all of our professors in the program are adjuncts. That is very much by design. All of our faculty uh, teach, um, or excuse me, are practitioners in compliance. Uh, and that is so that you all or our uh, students have folks who are teaching compliance who are actually practicing in compliance um, and really kind of are doing this every day and can bring in the most relevant examples and robust discussion um, from their everyday work. So that is very much by design. And for that, I thank you so much for all that you give to our students and taking time out of your day to do that, because I know that it's a lot. So um, happy to open it up for questions. Um, I will put my, uh, my contact information if you have questions. Um, as a follow-up or anything. David, thank you so much. You're welcome to hang out for questions too, but I know that you've got a busy day ahead of you. So um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Free for 15 minutes. I love taking questions. Yeah. And, and, you know, Kelly, I think it's so special, you know, in what we do is, is building groups of leaders, right? And uh, that impact that we get to have on the system is by building leadership. So really appreciate and honored right. for the time and, and the work that we get to do together. Yeah. I love having our faculty. And we got to go like to a Sounders game or a Timbers game. Or a <laughs> yeah, <Rangers. laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep the uh, personal, <laughs> the personal gratification type things on the side, but we'll figure it out. <laughs>
Plus, you know, World Cup's coming in 2026, right? So I hope they get you on the Seattle 2026 committee. That would be pretty fun. <laughs> well, maybe. We'll work on that. Yes, we should. Yeah. Peter Tomazawa is uh, uh, the CEO of that. So I I'm know. Sure they I just put saw. a good team together. <laughs> they did, yeah. You're welcome to raise your hand or I can unmute you or allow you to ask questions uh, and put them in the chat, however you like, if you have them. Well, I am not seeing any questions. So my information is up on the screen. Um, feel free to reach out if you all have any questions. Um, happy to help. I'm happy to set up uh, an individual time to chat uh, via Zoom or phone. Um, just drop me an email and we can set that up. Um, I hope to chat with some of you offline. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks again, David, for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope you all have a really good rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah, Bye, everyone. Sure.